What are you carrying, horses? That's right, 600 of them. Don't wake them, they're asleep. People who don't know better call us lucky. Look at your chum, they say, swanning all over Europe, meeting people, seeing life. What life? Driving a something lorry for days on end? The only reason I'm driving is that the old man reckons I'm the least tired of the four of us. I had six hours sleep last night. That's right, so I did. He must be slipping. From Grand Prix to Grand Prix, Monte, Zandfurt, Silverstone, Spa, Monza, Reims. To me, that's just an awful lot of road and dusty racetracks in between. See you in two days' time, the old man says. And what he means is 1,500 miles further south. Me and me mates, before we got mixed up in the Grand Prix circus, we had some friends once, long ago, but leaving at a wife or just a quiet evening at the cinema. That was light years ago. There are, the old man tells us, 2,567 parts. 1,430 move. Figure it out for yourself. What odds would you lay not one of them will come adrift in a three hours flat out race? A chum of mine who works at BRM spent all winter building up their latest monocoque. Six months of labour and love. First time out he shunted. Straight into a tree. A write off. 10,000 pounds with a motor car. That's life, mate. Start again. In Grand Prix racing, a car that pulls into pits for anything can be out. If this happens, we more or less spectate, butterflies in the stomach. We find a few things to do to keep us occupied. With luck, there's been no shunt, and nothing's come adrift. Oh yes, it's been known to happen. When it's all over, we strip her down. Engine, suspension, body, the lot. Everything's checked in the nearest tenth of a thou, split, pinned and wire locked, and smooth and lovely. That's how Jim, our chief mechanic, likes it. Not just a good job right for the night, 100%. Oh no, that's much too easy. Go on, he says, you must be joking. What's the matter with you? You're supposed to be the best mechanics in the world. From you, I want perfection plus. Funny thing, he gets it. Indeed, Monsieur Clark. Could we have your impressions for our viewers in France? Yes, sir, this is a great artist. Stupendo, Signor Saltese. Magnifico, John. Magnifico. There are few of them, the Grand Prix drivers, maybe two dozen. Since Fangio has retired, the best of them are British, like Jim Clark here. Don't think of them as sportsmen like jockeys or footballers. Think of them rather as fighter pilots, weaving a pattern with half a ton of metal, harnessing forces bent on their destruction, to defy reason and the law of gravity, to challenge death, to challenge their own questing doubts, and then to triumph through the most lethal idiom of our times, the motor car.
to seek in every hairpin bend of sloping straight the ultimate, the finite limit beyond which man and machine cannot survive. It's neither sane nor prudent, but it is glory, a towering fusion of man and machine, when for a trembling instant, man is supreme. <laughs> To dare, as men like Graham Hill do, and dare alone where others failed. This is the triumph. But it is private. One doesn't talk about it. Reporters rushing in their copy do not make mention of it. Briefly, it's expressed as 2 minutes 18.6, a broken lap record. A man who has audacity enough to reach for the stars needs, after he's touched them, to withdraw. Thirteenth, Monarcha Grand Prix. They want you one day earlier this year, Mr. Brabham. Roger phoned, can he catch a lift? Seventeenth, you're due at Zonvoort. On the 25th, you present a Formula 3 car to the best pupil driver for BP in London. You'll have to make a speech, witty and not more than ten minutes, they say. Tickets and reservations for your flight to Australia are OK, but Jim wants to know, are you coming back to Britain or are you going straight on to the States? Jack Brabham's father owned a greengrocer's shop in Sydney. Jim Clark comes from a farming family in Scotland. Sterling Moss's father is a dentist. Ireland Senior is a vet. Some drivers, such as Ireland, come with engineering backgrounds. Since he was about 13, Innes Island never wanted to do anything else. But he confesses, what a damn silly thing for a boy to say to his father, Daddy, I want to be a racing driver. Ireland Senior was and is a sensible and patient man. So Innes became an apprentice engineer to get him near to racing. It didn't. As soon as he could afford it, he started taking part in hill climbs and club trials. And he was lucky. Three seasons later, Innes Island was driving Grand Prix cars. Take any weekend at random. All over Britain, there will be something like a hundred different hill climbs, rallies, or trials. This is a generation that has grown up with motor cars, as previous generations had grown up with horses. Farmers and TV salesmen, chartered accountants and factory mechanics, young couples settled in suburbia who happen to like motor cars. Whose one idea of bliss is to strip down, hot up and put together, dangerously faster than it was, what used to be a self-respecting motor car. Bought second hand, cost 50 pounds and up. a rich man's sport, not all that widely spread. The daring of the Bentley boys at Brooklands, then England's premier track, and at Le Mans, are still recalled with awe. The drivers of these monsters were millionaires to a man. The cult remains. In Britain, there are more vintage motor cars than anywhere in the world. Our affection for them sometimes bewilders strangers, like cricket.
If you want cheap but distinguished sports car racing, they're for you. Or if you hanker after the nostalgic dream, back to the days when they built cars with hairs on their chest. Yep, facts are facts. These modern minis corner better, go almost as fast, but cost a fraction of the hairy monsters. As an example, in 1964, a Mini Cooper won the Monte Carlo Rally against all comers, including the biggest of cars. Royalty, pop singers and Debs adore it. Like everything else, democratize the sport, make it available. That's the trend and Britain's pioneered it. To be precise, John Cooper, that gifted car designer and garage proprietor from Surbiton, has been at work again. He was the first to produce small and cheap racing cars, Formulas 2 and 3, who looked and handled something like Grand Prix machines. Others have followed. Colin Chapman, ex-RAF, ex-aircraft engineer and racing driver turned car designer. In 1964, his cars, Lotus, succeeded BRM and Cooper, all British cars, to hold the World Constructors' Championship, the highest honor motor racing can bestow. In a few off-season months in winter, he fights for time to design next season's Grand Prix cars. Throughout the season, Chapman pilots his drivers and himself to race meetings all over Europe. His number one driver, Jim Clark, was 1963 world champion. Lotus keep one team of cars on the continent, one in Britain, and one in America. Three cars per team of five mechanics. Two drivers, two cars to race, one spare. One tiny imperfection in man or machine, and you're out. To design each year as perfect and advanced a piece of engineering as science can devise, you need a touch of genius. And only Chapman's wife knows how irritating genius can be. It's splendid to applaud one great heroic drive, the brilliant win of the outsider against all odds. Certainly it happens, but it's not enough. A racing team needs more wins, more points than anyone race after race. No aftermath of broken cars and drivers left behind in plaster cast. Two cars, two drivers constantly in fighting trim, that is enough. Win or get out, there's nothing in between. It's a startling fact that more car manufacturers have lost money through racing than any other reason. Most of the great marks of the motor world have at one time or another raced, but only a very few are left. From Italy, one honored name, Ferrari. From Britain, the BRMs, Brabhams, Coopers and Lotus. A win for Lotus means more sales of the other cars they build. A Monte Carlo victory brings 10,000 extra orders for Mini Coopers. There's nothing like a winning car for boosting sales throughout the world. Seen through a sales director's glasses and from the boardroom, racing is not a sport, it's a rough business. But because of it, the family saloons you drive on public roads now have disc brakes, improve suspension, corner more safely and faster, have longer lasting tires and better carburation. All these advances came and more will come from racing. Yet it's not the cars or the car designers who draw the crowds. John Cooper, Enzo Ferrari, Colin Chapman are certainly respected and on occasions feared throughout the racing world. Who in this crowd would know them? They come to Monza or to Monte to cheer the current crop of heroes, to stand in the giant shadow of Graham Hill, Jack Brabham, John Surtees, and Jim Clark. of envy for their fame, for their success. Someone has caught it and is cursing his luck if he's conscious. He's out now, shunted, but he'll be back if he can. Fangio crashed 12 times, nine for Sterling Moss, 
and Nuvolari, he lost count.
the slow flags but what a magnificent fight he put up during that tremendous dice he had with Dan Gurney earlier on when they broke the left record between them three times. Graham Hill now goes into the lead and what a race this promises to be between Graham Hill in the BRM and John Surtees in the Ferrari. Here they come past the grandstands very fast. They must be close to the lap record doing about 160 miles an hour I should say. Both going beautifully. Both getting ready to take their line for Paddock Bend. One of them must now give way. They're still holding on to their line.